Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in French Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Roxanne Panchassi. My guest in this episode is Anne Linton, the author of Unmaking Sex, The Gender Outlaws of 19th Century France. And the book was published by Cambridge University Press in 2022. Hi there, Anne. Hi, Roxanne. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. So, Anne, I always get these interviews started by asking people to tell us a little bit about, you know, how they came to work on Francophone Studies, France. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you came to the field? Sure. Yeah, I feel like everybody has uh, such great stories. And my story isn't, I mean, it's not that great, but um, (laughs) I'm sure that's not true. (laughs) It's always a little circuitous, right? So basically, in high school, I had just an amazing French teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm from a little tiny town in southern Oregon called Ashland. And my family doesn't speak French. There wasn't any opportunity to learn um, French before high school. So I didn't start until then. And she was just like amazing. She had this amazing gift of kind of creating an environment where it was okay for everybody to make mistakes Mm -hmm. in class. And I was terrified. And then I learned I became like progressively more comfortable being uncomfortable <laughs> and uh, and kept taking French. Um, and at the same time, as that uh, high school class in French, I was reading uh, Les Miserables in translation, of course, in like a literary analysis class and, and like an excerpted version. And I just had the idea, like the personal idea that I really wanted to be able to read it in French. I wanted to just stick with French and be able to to read the book. And so I realized that I was going to have to really take a lot of French <laughs> if that was the case. And when I was applying for schools, uh, for colleges and stuff, I found out that my parents didn't have, like, there was no savings for me at all to go to college. And they were just kind of like, well, you're going to have to work really hard and get get a scholarship and see how it goes, see if you can see if we can make it work. And so I worked my butt off in high school and I really wanted to go to Middlebury to, mm-hmm. to do French. Um, and I I was so lucky that I got in, but they like wanted my firstborn child. I mean, I think they gave me like the tiniest of tiny uh, scholarships. So I ended up going to a different school that gave me basically a full ride. And I was so mad at my parents that like, I don't know why it was like my type A rebellion against my parents was that I decided I would pursue international business and just like ignore French. So I, you know, because they wanted me to do what I was interested in and what I loved and they didn't care about. They made the right choices and didn't care about money. And then I was pissed that I couldn't go to the school that I wanted to because I was an angsty teenager. (laughs) So I did I did a dual degree in French and international business and I studied abroad and I was at a business school in in Paris and had an internship in another life at Louis Vuitton which was a whole nother story wow uh, uh yeah it was a that was a rude awakening to the 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 world of luxury goods uh that I knew absolutely nothing about I hated it basically I spent all day selling bags to people that the brand felt were good enough to buy the bags and not selling them to people that they didn't want to buy the bags. And it was horrible. I just felt like the whole industry uh, and the whole field of international business was like morally bankrupt. And at the same time, I was finally like fluent enough in French that I could read the literature that I had read in translation, that I could have like real conversations. And so that part of my life and my experience abroad was so much more meaningful. And the business aspect was just like became really painful and sad. And I, you know, I didn't want to do that. So I decided to go to grad school in French literature because that was the only thing I was really passionate about. And I didn't want to, you know, I I didn't want to keep going with the business route. And then, I mean, for the other things, I just got incredibly lucky. You know, how did I get a job? I got incredibly lucky. The fact that I'm employed in our field is like, you know, crazy. One of the things I like about the story you just told is, well, especially that beginning of, you know, those of us who French is in our first language, like that exploration of the language is such a a common beginning for people, right? And what you said about your teacher making space for mistakes, 
like not only is that linguistically important, but it kind of is professionally in all kinds of other ways. So I, I don't know. I think it's a good story. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, I definitely am mindful of that in my own teaching and I try to create that environment in the classes um, that I'm offering so that people, you know, understand that that's how you learn. You make mistakes and then, you know, you keep trying. So you did graduate work in French literature. And how did you come to the subject of this book in particular, Anne? Yeah, that's a good question. It's really by accident. I mean, when I was preparing my oral exams, there were just so many references in the 19th century novels that I was reading, the really canonical texts um, about gender ambiguous characters. Um, And like, it's even some of like, the most womanizing male characters in Balzac are like, also very androgynous, like Henri de Marseille. And I just wondered what was going on um, at the time in medical literature um, and in scientific discourse and in legal discourse, like what was the kind of the cultural background that was creating the environment that there were all of these characters? Um, And just even beyond the characters, there are just a series of really canonical, well-known novels by Henri de Balzac and Théophile Gautier, where like the reader or the other characters in the novel don't know the gender identity of the main character. And like the whole plot is kind of turning around, figuring out the gender of that character. Mm -hmm. So so when I started the project, it was like, what's going on in these novels and what's going on at the the medical literature at the same time and and legal discourse. Um, and I found that, you know, this question about the this preoccupation with the gender identity and the, becoming like a, a mystery or like a motor for plot, um, that that was kind of a parallel discourse that you see in the medical literature at the same time where you have all of these historical case studies where doctors are um, have come into contact with um, intersex people, and um, sometimes they're t- trying to determine uh, the the true sex of the patient, and so a lot of times um, they're not. But the ways that they're telling a story about sex and gender are are really parallel to to what's happening in the literature from the time period as well. Mm-hmm. So you decided to do this project that kind of brings together those towering fields, you know, of the nineteenth century in the French context. But coming from literary studies to begin with, at least. Right. So like the way that it's often talked about in literature, I mean, I mean, such a big theme in in canonical novels that, you know, there's been a lot written about it, but it's usually talked about as kind of the myth of androgyny. And it's usually talked about um, as kind of this like timeless um, representation of androgyny that stretches back to Plato or Ovid. Um, and that doesn't really, that can be true. And there are definitely a lot of allusions um, to Plato and Ovid in Gautier's writing um, and in many of the other authors. But at the same time, it doesn't really explain anything about the specificity of that time period, you know, of the night and why there was this particular fascination then. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as soon as I started looking at what was going on in the medical literature at the same time, I found like literally hundreds of of case studies. Um, So there's this huge proliferation of medical discourse at the exact moment of that we see this increase in, in literary representations. And so it was really the fact that they were concomitant that that made me think that I should explore the question in greater detail or look into it a little bit more. Um, I have so many questions, Anne, but since you just said this thing about them being concomitant, and I don't want you to, I don't expect you to be like, no, this came first, but but do you have a sense, is there a sense in the book of the conversations happening between the two fields? Like, is that a, a central kind of thing that you're chasing in, in, in these chapters in this project? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think it's a chicken or an egg kind of a problem. I think that, you know, we we tend to think today of literature and science as, you know, really completely opposed, um, but they weren't uh, at all in the 19th century. Um, You have like 
naturalists uh, like Emile Zola that were repurposing scientific discourse in order to write fiction, you know, in the in the 1870s and 80s at the end of the century. And at the beginning, um, around, you know, during the Restoration, when Balzac was writing, you have all of these naturalists um, who are writing on teratology or the study of um, what was called monstrosity mm-hmm. in the 19th century, you know, just very basically congenital variations um, of the human body in, in humans and other animals. And so these the people were talking to each other. And so that that dialogue and and the um, exchanges between doctors and novelists and scientists and um, that's definitely something that I hope comes out yeah. uh, in the book. It's one of the fascinating things about this book is the kind of approach that you take in your readings, but of all of these different types of sources. And I'm going to come back to asking you some more maybe detailed questions about the material you're working with in this in this project, but also just the kind of, I mean, at some basic level, like the common thread of storytelling. This is at some level about the stories that people told and t- continue to tell about bodies you know, their own bodies, but also the bodies of others and how that that makes for almost like a, like, why wouldn't you look at <laughs> the way that those narratives cross domains and um, genres, not just within literary studies or within medicine, but between them, right? Right. And I think that the question of why it hadn't been looked at is really fascinating as well. Um, but I think, I think it's related to just this general invisibilization of intersex, like even in our contemporary time. Um, But because the majority of the literary um, critics and the historians who had talked about androgyny and representations of androgyny in in literature from, from the 19th century had really argued that it was completely divorced from intersex from actual bodily variations, Uh there was sort of an unwillingness to actually explore what was happening in medical cases. There are great um, and really important exceptions to that. Alice Drager has a really important book in the last quarter of the 19th century that's looking at, you know, medical, uh, just medical cases. And it's a comparative study between France um, and England. It's a really important um, and, and brilliant book. But it wasn't looking at literature, right? Um, and mm-hmm. so, yeah, it just it didn't it didn't seem like the dual approach had had been fully explored. And so that that's what I was trying to do in the project. So, can we talk about this nineteenth century? Um, how is it if it is sandwiched between I don't know the revolution, the turn of the century, some other moment in the later nineteenth century? Like, how do you kind of understand the the period that the book covers and whatever it's whole is or wholeness is and then also the france part of it which you brought up you know referencing this other scholarship like i think 19th century france for all kinds of reasons is such a site for especially the discussion of the kinds of things that you're talking about in literary and medical discourse and you know what you might tell us about how we might think about france as distinct in that field okay yeah so first when i say 19th century i I'm sort of always meaning like long 19th century, sure. um, which for, you know, which for me is like, you know, the the turn of the the end of the revolution, basically, you know, until like 1914. And the reason why I chose that window of time, the longer 19th century, is because beyond about uh, 1914, and when you start to get into like the First World War period, there's a change in the technology, the medical technology, that means that the medical cases are fundamentally different from the ones that you see in the beginning of the 19th century. Mm-hmm. So they're starting to change. They're tr- starting to perform a lot more surgeries on intersex people, mm-hmm. including uh, children, which is not something that you see at all or almost at all in the early part of the 19th century. So the medicine is different, and then the literature becomes uh, very different too. So, I mean, the large corpus of, of novels that I was looking at, both popular and canonical, are really in in that period of time. Why France? Um, oh, 
such a big question. And so many people have answered this so much more eloquently and poignantly than I ever could. Than I, ever could. I mean, I just think that during the long 19th century, sex and gender were under so much strain from so many different sides that, you know, questions about intersex resonated to a wider audience and generated more fascination because of the social and cultural instability about sex and gender in, you know, in the 19th century. Um, so yeah, I say the 19th century, but it, of course, it's different at different moments. Mm -hmm. um, it, sure. I hope that in the book, it comes across, you know, some of those nuances come across as I as I talk about, you know, the early part of the 19th century, you know, when uh, Isidore Geoffroy saint hilaire's work on teratology came out in the 1830s, for example, compared to the really pathologized view of intersex at the fin de siècle, um, when there were all of these doctors working on inversion, what they called inversion, and how that affected the medical cases during that time period as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that really does come through from, well, not only from, but from at least, you know, your discussion of the implications of the Napoleonic Code and what implications the Napoleonic Code didn't have, even though people have sort of tended to assume that they had, that, that the code had the effect of making things rigid and sort of settling them, or at least helping to bring about this history of non -con no contest or no resistance to, to this binary framework. And and then, you know, when you talk about different shifts in literary mode throughout the 19th century, and then of course, yeah, when you talk about the the impact of a kind of emergent set of ideas around degeneration, that those things all shape this changing landscape. That's really important. I mean, the, the changing aspects of the different ideas about intersex and how um, how it moved through time throughout the century um, is really, really important mm -hmm. because just like today, when we say intersex, it doesn't mean one thing. It's an umbrella term for a broad range of bodily variations. And the various words, and there were different words um, in the 19th century that were used to describe intersex, also meant different things to different publics um, and were changing and were contested. You know, intersex isn't a monolith. It doesn't mean one one thing. Um, and it definitely didn't in the 19th century, you know, throughout the century as well. I'm so glad you've brought us here because, of course, we need to talk about terminology. There's yours, <laughs> um, you know, French, English. Just a tiny question about the problem of language and um, how you... <laughs> deal with that, you know, in the source material that you're working with and through how you think about your, I mean, there's, you know, of course, your big skillful and important use of, you know, quotations throughout when you're using terms like hermaphrodite or, uh, you know, talking about things like true sex, but you're also writing this book in the 21st century. Uh, and we'll come back around to this when we talk about some of the contemporary implications and resonances of this project, where you're also kind of potentially responding to or anticipating readers who are thinking through these questions now. I guess I want to ask just less like for a detailed accounting but, and more just what's that experience like as a researcher and a writer negotiating all of that? And what are some of the decisions maybe that you had to make along the way about your use of terminology, the relationship between that and the historical sources that you're, that you're working with? Yeah, I think that that's probably... The question of terminology is one of the things that, you know, anybody who's working in the fields of sex and gender in the past, we have to think about. We have to mm -hmm. try to reconcile the differences between the ways we use, the changing ways we're using language now and the changing ways um, it was used in the past. And I think that that slowed me down writing this book a lot because sure. it was hard to make a decision. Um, and in the end, I mean, I can only say... I've made a decision. I can't say it was the right decision. Can't say I would make that decision again necessarily, but you know, I had to make a decision in the book. And the decision that I made was to use the contemporary terminology intersex in my own analysis, but to still engage with the historical terms and the different categories that were used in the 19th century to talk about um, intersex. And some of them were like um, hermaphrodite as as you said, um, you know, or doubtful sex um, or unknown sex. Uh, and even like 
sex neutre or like troisième sex, like a, a neutral or a neuter sex or a third, uh, a third sex. Um, and the problem is that some of those words have been really repudiated um, and are intensely painful to members of the intersex um, community today. And so I don't want to perpetuate the violence of reusing those terms in my own analysis. But I also want to try to understand what when somebody like Isidore Geoffroy saint or Honoré de Balzac, when they're using the word hermaphrodite, what that meant to, to them and what were the other discourses that were circulating at the same time. So I'm trying to be really attentive to historical specificity while at the same time not perpetuating violence. Because, I mean, the overall goal of the the book is really to de-invisibilize intersex and to make it clear that, um, you know, we all know about Hercules Barbin, but there were literally hundreds more people who lived um, in the 19th century. And, and we may not be able to access their first person words because those are real limitations in the archive, but they still have important things to tell us. And we can still glimpse some of their reactions and their thoughts, um, even viewed problematically from the outside um, in, in medical cases, which are, you know, biased and problematic, um, or in legal cases, which are also problematic. The goal is to try to present the material without alienating uh, people in the present who are going to read uh, this and and see ancestors, um, uh-huh. you know, in the 19th century. It was challenging because in my training, um, I was really, things are starting to ch- shift now, which is great. I think since Jen Mannion's um, book came out, uh-huh. especially, and I'm, I'm really grateful for Jen's work, which has influenced uh, me a lot. Uh-huh. But you know, in my training, it was sort of, we were sort of always trained to like stamp out anachronism and you can't use terms that weren't, that didn't exist. Um, and I think really in this project, it's important to try, try to do both. That was sort of my goal, whether or not it was successful remains to be seen. The, the readers will decide. <laughs> you mentioned Herculean Anne, which, mm-hmm. you know, Everybody knows, like you said, (laughs) maybe not everybody knows, but could we use that as an example of what you're trying to do differently with respect to the history of sexuality uh, in this project? Yeah, yeah. You know, Ertudine Barbant is the most well-known example um, of intersex, not just from 19th century France, but like the whole, uh, whole period, you know. And so even today, Barbant's birthday on November 8th marks the intersex day of remembrance. I guess just briefly um, to summarize for for those uh, readers who haven't had the immense gift of reading the memoirs, I would really encourage you to. Hercunine Barbant um, is the author of the only known memoir written by an intersex person in 19th century France. Um, And so it gives us the only first person account of the hopes and the triumphs and the aspirations and also, you know, the daily experiences of an intersex person from that time. Um, And it's really crucial because the memoirs represent the only first person point of access into the everyday lives and experiences of an intersex person from that time period. But even so, you know, the memoirs were not completely unmediated. Um, Tardieu, the doctor who published uh, the memoirs, only published the part that he found most interesting. um, And the excised portions of the manuscript were never found. Um, And I've often really wondered, you know, how would they be different if if we had the whole thing? Mm -hmm. I suspect it would be uh, really different. So um, Hercule Barbant was, you know, an extraordinary individual who was also well-educated and was a teacher, born in 1836 um, and assigned female, um, consistent with, you know, you mentioned earlier the Napoleonic Code. Um, yeah. And the code required that um, all infants be assigned a sex within three days of birth. And so Barbant was assigned female, um, consistent with basically that French uh, law. But then like extreme abdominal pain led to a series of very invasive medical examinations much later in life that uncovered intersex variation and that ultimately led to illegal sex revision. And so Baobao's birth record was amended to read uh, male 
um, and Barbin's name on that record was changed. Um, and at first, like in the memoirs, there's sort of some optimism that Barbin will succeed in the capital with a fresh start. But because of the legal sex revision, it became impossible to cite any past work experience. And that left um, Barbin really only qualified for low paid and labor intensive work. And then Barbin is also like extremely isolated and separated from family and friends and Sarah, um, Barbin's lover. And so very rapidly, at least in this version of the memoirs that we have uh, today, that's surviving today, Barbin descends into despair and destitution um, and commits suicide tragically in 1868 at which point the complete memoirs were found by doctors from the state registry office mm. um, and the intersex variation was uncovered inadvertently. And then at that point, they went back and found that Barbin had earlier been um, the subject of a medical publication right before the legal sex revision. Um, so the, the memoirs really reveal in the most heartbreaking way possible what a legal sex revision meant to the people who were forced into them. Mm. Um, and the position taken by... Um, Morgan Holmes and Hida Valoria and Georgianne Davis and many of the other intersex scholars and activists who read Balban's story as one of an a ancestor really is that Balban was forced into it. Oh. Um, and so their, their work helps us to see parallels between medical interventions in the 19th century and the so-called medical management of intersex in the 20th century, mm -hmm. you know, through the present, um, in which intersex babies and children are subjected to What's predominantly unnecessary medical interventions that have caused really enduring physical and psychological trauma? So that's sort of Balban's story and, and the legacy. In terms of the history of sexuality, I mean, I've mentioned that Tardieu published the memoirs, the excerpted memoirs in 1872 for the first time, and then again in 1874. But they don't really become, they're hugely well known in the 19th century. Balban's life becomes the most cited life in all of the, uh, in all of the medical cases following the publication of the memoirs. Mm -hmm. Today, when we think of Hercudine Barbin, you like can't think of Barbin almost without thinking of Foucault. Right. I can. <laughs> right. When Foucault um, published Barbin's memoirs, I think in 1968, and then uh, shortly after that, maybe it's 78, Shortly after that, the English version, it's actually only in the English version of the memoirs that Foucault has this preface where he talks about mm. true sex. And he basically advances the argument that in the 19th century, all doctors believed that everybody was born with binary sex. Um, and it could be really hard to figure out in the case of people born with intersex traits, but it was always there on the body and it was totally up to doctors and experts um, to figure it out. And what I'm trying to show in the book is that like all every historian ever has ever said, it's a little bit more complex than that. You know, there were a lot of doctors that became increasingly aware that it was um, difficult and in some in some cases actually impossible to assign a binary sex to some of the patients that they were looking at. And so their interactions with patients in some cases challenged their pre-existing views of, about sex um, and gender. Yeah, I I find it to be a fascinating example of the kind of turn that you're taking in this project um, away from some of those kinds of assumptions that have been so built into the field of the history of sexuality, like building on, I mean, Foucault is such a, a tricky one, right? Because it's like, we're all indebted. <laughs> <laughs> but so the way that you're re-examining that history uh, and the swirl around it, right? Like the way that it then became a kind of model for other medical commentaries and discussions, but also became a part of the kind of literary imagination about intersex people subsequently, right? Like that mm -hmm. that, that story towers in this way and that by re-examining it and thinking about its complexities or maybe there have been assumptions about a certain chronological unfolding of these things and a kind of certainty in the 19th century that really wasn't there. And you're pointing to that resistance. Am I getting that right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I think that both Foucault and Tardieu took the memoirs and used, you know, they're both powerful men in their own time. Yeah. And who took 
took uh, Balban's words and leveraged them to make an argument about true sex. Um, and that isn't the argument that Barbin is making in the memoirs. And anyone who reads that can see that that's not how Barbin is writing about desire and uh, identity. Um, and so what I'm trying to do in the book is show that that isn't an isolated example, right? There, there are many other um, cases where um, what's going on isn't just a discussion about true sex. I'm trying to I'm trying to shift the focus away from true sex and, and to think about um, the lives of the um, of intersex uh, people and the those born with intersex traits in the 19th century, and then also ideas about non-binary sex and not just um, true sex. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. that's very much there in all of the discourse, and I think that reveals how indebted I am to Foucault. But at the same time, I can still say, you know, yeah. right? There's there's more than five cases, right? There's it's more complex. One of the things that I find really compelling about the book, and along these lines, is that when it comes to the literary sources that you're working with, you're also looking at like canonical writers, like the biggest ticket writers of 19th century French literature and bringing those readings together with readings of a whole world of popular, lesser known uh, literary sources and authors, and then bringing those together with the medical stuff, some of which might be familiar to people who know about 19th century medical history. And I guess I just wanted to ask you about that, you know, in terms of reaching an audience of readers, but also thinking about how you work with those different types of materials in, in a project like this? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Definitely when it started out, I, I was looking at these canonical authors um, like mm -hmm. Théophile Gautier and Mademoiselle de Maupin or, you know, uh, Sierra Fita with Balzac or, you know, Zola's writing. Um, and as I continued to research more, I found out that there's an increasingly well-known corpus of popular literature from the 19th century about intersex. Um, and I think the earliest example of, of that is uh, Cuisance Clémentine, Orpheline et Androgyne from 1820. And what's fascinating, what was fascinating to me reading uh, all of these novels is that the popular work kind of became a missing link between the canonical novels that we all have read uh, and know really well and the medical literature. Um, you know, in because in the popular novels like uh, Clementine, it's very clear that what the authors are talking about is actual intersex um, and and not androgyny or some sort of mythological. I mean, it's just like it's very clear because doctors mm -hmm. medicine play a role um, in in the text. Um, and so it's interesting to me to think about, um, you know, it's we know some like lesser well known, but still really important um, books on on intersex like Fragoletta, Henri de Latouche's Fragoletta, we know that that influenced for sure like Gautier and Balzac because they say that, you know, in their in their writing where we don't know if Clementine, uh, if they had read any of any of those uh, those works at all. Um, but what's interesting to me is that a lot of the scenes reappear. <laughs> so I kind of, wow. you know, I kind of wonder um, if, yeah, you know, if they if they did. Um, but either way, um, the fact that there is this kind of secondary corpus of of novels um, that many of them published, you know, that that were republished um, and that were fairly widely read, um, but have been mostly forgotten about um, today. The fact that this this other corpus exists really just demonstrates, I think, the level of um, fascination um, with intersex in, in 19th century France, like across multiple discourses. It makes me want to ask, I mean, I already wanted to ask you about this, um, partly just because the book is really so striking, right, to look at. Like it's, I mean, I hope you're happy because it's it's kind of an amazing object right? You mean the cover? Yeah, the cover, I mean, and and the image, the, who is it? It's uh, it's Nadam, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. The image on the cover. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, I wanted to ask about the, the you know, certainly the 
book makes this obviously compelling argument about the medical and literary and how those things are are connected, implicated, all of that. But to think about this in in a broader field, and you do, you have some illustrations in the book um, that covers really, you know, just yeah, stunning in the way it's done. But to think about the relationship between the field of sources that you're exploring in the book and yeah, the broader visual culture of the 19th century, how that participates in the, you know, connections between the readings of the physical body and then the storytelling and narrative that is so much a, an emphasis of, of this project and how you kind of see that intersects conversation, questions, debates, permeating a broader culture and society and politics of this period, you know, just anything you want to say about that, especially with respect to the visual culture of 19th century. Press. Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, the cover of the book was designed by an artist and it it's it is it's a photograph. Um, it's taken from Nadar's series. You know, I made the decision in the book not to include any uh, photography of intersex, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the same reasons that we were talking about earlier with language. There's a legacy of trauma as a result of the medical photography of intersex. Um, yeah. That photo to me isn't a medical uh, photograph. And what I loved yeah. about the way the artist designed it um, was, I mean, that it conveyed on making because it's, it's, uh, it's inverted, but also in the space between the bodies, there's like, there's a new body kind of left yeah. out. Um, and it's like, um, the book is trying to attend to the lives of those born with intersex variations in 19th century France. So to me, the photograph of a person was compelling in that regard. Um, but at the same mm -hmm. time, it's trying to uh, it's trying to deconstruct, you know, the the medical discourse. The visual representations are really important, even in in the novels. Um, yeah. um, and I mean, there's a, there's a lot of there are a lot of references to the sculpture and the Louvre, um, the Raphaelite sculpture in the Louvre, um, and also art and and representation are are key in in the literary works um, as well. Usually when you see these medical images in the case study, the the engravings um, are trying to sort of demonstrate the veracity of a point that a doctor is making. And so it's kind of like evidence, you know, in, in some ways. And what's interesting about some of the engravings that you find is that there's this weird hybrid combination of you know, on the one hand, they're trying to expurgate what it is that they're showing by, you know, putting numbers or letters to identify the different parts. And at, on the other hand, you know, a lot of times um, what the the image that is shown is is much more um, eroticized and it reveals more about erotic imagination. Mm. So, I mean, like those 18th century engravings that I included are very. Oh, yeah. Are very much like that. You know, they have. Um, the subject that's like surprised in a state of undress, but then there's like little A, B, C, D. Like, oh, yeah. Right. Like the fee. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Uh, right. Whatever. Whoever did that figure that one that's sort of like it's like looking at some kind of who am I thinking of? Like, I go now. You know, like, yeah. it's like the, the surprise in the garden or something. But um, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's I mean, that's another example of just this sort of a fusion between. Yeah. Um, you know, what we think of uh, this this medical discourse and this really um, this imagination that's coming out of the literature from from the time period. Just as kind of an aside, but not really like I think the other thing I'm a little obsessed with the cover of your book, apparently. But like the other thing that I think is really great about the, the image or really interesting about the image that you use on the, that's used on the cover is that there's clothing, right? Like a little bit mm -hmm. or. Because I was also thinking about that, like fashion, and when you talk about sort of the set of explanations that point in the direction of why there's this fascination in medical, literary, and other kind of domains around intersex people, um, that, you know, it's about changing ideas of the family, it's about um, urbanization, and, you know, it's a lot of this is based in Paris, but also just the sort of shifting landscape in other domains right and and yeah that 
the small element, the small, that detail of clothing. Well, it, I think it has a lot of effects in the photograph and the way that it's used on the cover. So I, yeah, definitely. I mean, what's interesting about those, that series of, you know, Nadar took a series of, I think they're 10 photographs that are, you know, really famous and that I've, I've looked, I've written about elsewhere, but I didn't want to talk about in the book. But what's interesting about them is that often they've been read as kind of a visual case study. Um, but I think that what's, what's happening in the series of images is a little bit, you know, um, I think that Nadar might actually be kind of subverting the medical discourse. Um, but historians often look at the look at the stockings that you see and, and think that, that means that the individual was um, probably assigned female. And so it's interesting that when people look at the images, there is this sort of desire to assign uh, a true sex even now. Um, that, that's yeah. one thing that comes out um, when you when you read. Uh, books and articles about the series. So, and can we talk about the, you know, the structure of the book as a way of kind of getting at, we never have time to, you know, get into every single chapter in the book. And we've already brought up like a number of issues that run throughout the project and then come up in different chapters in different ways. But those two parts of the book, cultural prehistory of intersex from the archives, part one, um, and then part two, contextualizing high and low literary narratives, just thinking about how especially from a, you know, a writing and organizational point of view, because um, I think that's some of what we can offer in these interviews for people, like a bit of a behind the scenes of how did you do this? Um, you know, thinking about this project as one where you're bringing together these methodologies, sources, uh, approaches in the 19th century, and then your own as a scholar, and then having to, you know, map it out. So things are moving roughly chronologically over the course of the book, but you're also dividing, but still not totally dividing the arguments and discussion of the material into these two parts. So do you want to, do you want to tell us a little bit about how that happened if it's not too painful to revisit? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think this is another thing where, you know, you make a decision. Um, I think the my intent um, in structuring the book in two parts was really to, in the first part, provide the cultural history uh, from the medical cases and from the legal discourse um, that al that allowed me to reread some of the canonical literature and then, you know, the less well-known literature in the second half of the book. So mm -hmm. that's why they're kind of separate. The the original project was a lot bigger and a lot longer and <laughs> um, and this is what this is what you're allowed to do with a hundred thousand words. And so, you yeah. know, um so it is so it is separate um in in some ways, but as you say, um I I bring the medical literature back into the cases that I'm reading. I just want to provide that sort of the summary of what my findings were in in the first part of the book. Another thing that I find really important um, and interesting as a as a point that you're making is that um, how do I say this? That you know, readers might be might be inclined to get a little carried away by the the revolutionary nature of some of the authors that you're looking at and some of the the, the narratives that you're looking at as kind of you know, radical openings to a whole new world or like some kind of utopian uh, post-sex, post-gender universe. Like sometimes when we're looking for things historically, all of us, um, you know, might think we're finding that in the, the sources that we're, we're seeing in terms of like either, you know, doctors or other uh, scientific and medical personnel who seem to create openings or even examples from the literary imagination that seem to be kind of revolutionary in their presentation of ambiguous sex or, you know, doubtful sex, some of these other kinds of things. So yeah, could you say a little bit about how you respond to or how you think about the relative conservatism, I guess, when it comes to these ideas, bodies, people of the authors that you're dealing with and the, the doctors and others that you're dealing with? relative to the the triumph of like normativity in the 19th century and into the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, I mean this that's this is an important struggle and important uh -huh. um balance. Um 
and it always comes up in my teaching as well because I, you know, I'll teach Mademoiselle de Maupin and think, you know, this is this is amazing. Like, can you believe that this is happening in the 19th century? That this, the, you know, this character is saying "Je suis dans troisième sexe à part." Yeah, n'a pas encore. No. Yeah. You know, like, how, isn't this amazing? And they're like, "Oh my gosh, this is terrible." Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so um, yeah, I mean. The way I see it in literature, um, I think what, you know, what Mademoiselle de Maupin and many of these other novels is do are doing throughout the entire novel by creating this story about a character whose gender is unknown um, is extending the possibility, is allowing us to, you know, escape for a moment while we're reading this book, the triumph of heteronormativity mm. in in the 19th century and that you know at the end it invariably doesn't end well for these uh for these characters um well Maupin absconds by night so it you know that's I guess that's more hopeful but very often you know um Fregoleta dies by the sword and uh Serafita ascends to the heavens um so very very often there is you know an, a very heteronormative ending that's sort of seen as a way to um or like put out as a way to compensate somehow for for the the things that the novel has done that challenged the the order of things but for me that's like more of a smoke screen i mean that's just kind of how i see i don't think the novel is really about how it ends um um and so yeah i mean i think the medical history of intersex um is different in the 19th century is very different from the 20th century but it is still um incredibly traumatic and uh painful and you i mean you can see that from what happened uh from barbans descriptions of um first person accounts of the um of the examinations um and you can glimpse it from reading uh from reading the cases and it's in many ways a very, very dark um, history. Mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly in in the end of the 19th century, when degeneration theory really takes hold, um, it fundamentally shifts the way that doctors are interacting with their patients. Um, mm -hmm. And you see, you, you know, you really see for the first time in these cases the uh, the preconceived notion that because somebody's body uh, is different, that they they're also predisposed to uh, mental illness, and that that supposition doesn't come in that doesn't start at all um, before degeneration theory. Um, mm. And so, yeah, I mean, it's I wouldn't say revolutionary at all, really, right. yeah. <laughs> in, in in many ways. Um, but I do hope that the book makes people think about the 19th century um, in a little bit more of a nuanced way than just like the single most, the one fascination with all doctors is to determine the true sex of their patients, that that's the only thing that ever happens. Um, you know, it's that's not accurate. Um, and um, I think it's fascinating to me that you can read um, these cases and the popular literature um, and even like canonical literature against Sola and realize that um, there's some um, there's some gender creativity happening, certainly that Zola wasn't coping uh, for in spite of himself. You know, one of the things I've always really loved is, you know, when he published uh, the preface to the Roman de l'Inverti uh, at the end of the 19th century, and in in the anonymous Italian author's uh, comments about Zola, he says that uh, La Cure was his favorite novel because he sees his own life and his experiences in that novel. And I've always really adored that fact, the fact that, hmm. um, you know, the one of the queer heroes of the 19th century uh, was told Zola that he, that, he, that he could see himself in his text. I, will, um, I, I would love to see Zola's face when he when he read that. <laughs> That's great. Um, you come around, you know, in the epilogue of the book and to thinking about 
the contemporary connections and resonances that readers and others might make and that and that you make and that you know I'm sure somewhere in there is part of the you know motivations of the project the historical motivations literary motivations intellectual all those other things but there's a politics to writing about this stuff in the 21st century as you well know um so could we talk a little bit about that about how you kind of understood working on this in these years that I'm sure it took to to, to pull this off um and you know, what you would want contemporary readers to get from the book. I mean, one of the things that I found reading it in the midst of, you know, I live in Canada, you live in the United States, but in the midst of conversations about how everything has changed or how things that used to be settled (laughs) are somehow unsettled or that there's an imagination that things are unsettled now. And then of course you look historically and that's not at all the case. You know, you're right. These debates in the 19th century that even if we don't want to call these authors revolutionary at all, that the idea that things have, that there's a historical instability here that hasn't been introduced by some secret cabal or anything like that, that that's, that's one of the possibilities, just one of the possibilities that a project like this offers to contemporary readers, activists, others who are kind of looking for a broader archive to, to kind of bring to contemporary debates and, and, and conversations. So yeah, could you say a little bit about how you understand the book as not just part of a, a scholarly co- set of conversations about the past, but that, you know, you're in the thick of it uh, in terms of contemporary debates around some of these questions, especially where you live in the United States, but not only there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think everything you've just said really, really resonates mm. uh, with me. I mean, I think that, you know, the 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 most important lesson that, I mean, the, the most important thing that sort of like the 19th century debate ab- about, you know, what they called hermaphrodism or, you know, intersex, you know, what this 19th century debate can teach us about today is really, you know, that intersex folks have always been here mm-hmm. and they're always going to be here because intersex, you know, is just a, a term, an umbrella term for a broad range of naturally occurring bodily variations. So, you know, the vocabulary is dynamic today as it was in the past, but the people have always um, been here. Um, but, you know, one key difference between the 19th century and our own time is this medical management of intersex. Mm-hmm. Um, and so intersex scholars and activists have really been arguing since the 1990s um, that babies born with intersex traits should not be subjugate, uh, subjected to unnecessary medical interventions. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is like this is really a difference because in the 19th century, um and especially in the beginning of the the century, the, the technological limitations meant that the bodies of babies and children were not being systematically altered mm. to fit cultural beliefs about what a boy or a girl should look at look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, all of the debates. I mean, this this really intersex and transgender are t- t- totally uh, distinct contemporary um, um, terms, um, but they're they're related um, in, you know, in in the contemporary sphere, I mean, particularly in this country, but really all over, you know, with uh, the debates over mm-hmm. trans participation in sports and, you know, the, the bombing threats on um, hospitals that are performing gender affirming care. Um, so, I mean, my point in the book is that in the 19th century, intersex was really becoming increasingly visible. Um, because of all of these medical cases, because of these stories, because of um, the increasing venues for publication, um, whereas it was rendered increasingly invisible, you know, in our own time following John Money's work um, at Hopkins. Um, And so I think that, you know, this invisibilization was maybe a factor for some of these literary critics who were first trying to think about literary representations of androgyny, that maybe there was like a theoretical and discursive limitation that prevented them from seeing what, um, you know, from taking intersex embodiment seriously. Um, And so that also then would prevent them from 
considering how these novels might be actually considering intersex embodiment and not just referring to myth- mythology. Um, so those are some things, I guess, that I'm uh, that I'm thinking about. Um, and it's as you mentioned before. I mean, this is a um, right now we're so fortunate that um, there's there's so much new work coming out. Um, uh, amazing work um, by historians like Jen Mannion, female husbands, um, Kit Halem's Before We Were Trans, I just read is uh, uh, fantastic mm-hmm. as well. Um, you know, so much new work that's really uncovering uh, LGBTQIA plus individuals in the past. Um, and that's really important. But at the same time, we're in this contemporary moment um, where intersex people but trans people also as well are just really under attack Mm -hmm. Uh, and um so you know it's it's hard to write about without thinking about what's happening um in the present but at the same time what was happening in the period of time that i'm looking at in the book is also fundamentally different Uh, and so that's what um, so that those are some things that I'm thinking about. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I could just talk about this with you for hours, but I, I'm not allowed to. Um, no one will listen to our six hour interview, Anne. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what's happened since the book came out and what you what you're kind of looking forward to in terms of subsequent projects? Anything you want to share about, about what's going on for you now? Yeah, um, I'm working on my next book project. Um, I also teach a lot at San Francisco State, mm-hmm. so I'm working slowly yeah. <laughs> on my on my next book project with a really high teaching load. Uh, not really high relatively, but high high for me. Sure. Um, so um, in my next book, I'm trying to think about um, literary imaginings of gender crossings, like within the context of 19th century technology, um, that was beginning to realize the potential to modify gendered embodiment. Um, so for example, like early reproductive surgeries, like ovarectomy or surgeries on adults with intersex traits in the 19th century that were sometimes also elective. Um, so we often think of the technology for changing sex as not really emerging until the 20th century. Um, but there's a lot of recent scholarship in intersex studies that has uncovered the kind of intertwined medical history of intersex and transgender in this country, um, especially by Hill Malatino and uh, Sandra Eder just wrote a, a great book as well. Um, so while new work in historical trans studies has really drawn attention to precursors to trans um, at the you know at at the same time, so my new book project um, argues that technological innovations ensured that medicine would one day be able to transform bodies to express identities for which no language yet existed. So it's trying to trace the emergence of trans technology further in the past, like long before it was named um, at a period of time when binary sex was really seemed to be under attack. Um, from all sides. So that's that's sort of the next project. And I also recently um, co-edited a volume of Yale French Studies with Raisa Rexer on photography. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, photography and the body in 19th century France. Um, and that brings together some essays by literary and art historians and comparatists and the curators of France's really preeminent photographic collections at the Bibliothèque Nationale and the Musée d'Orsay. And Raisa and I are both proud of the fact that like the authorship of that volume is is as diverse as the content of the essays. So it tries to really push beyond gender and geographic and cultural boundaries. Um, So I was really happy to get to uh, work with all of those authors on on that project as well. Well, Anne, I just want to thank you so much for writing the book and for taking the time to speak with me about it today. Thanks so much to you for inviting me and taking the time to read the book and ask me these wonderful questions. 